so cute gimbal. We learned last week, after having learned of the visit of Malka Shavar, the Queen of Sheba, to Eretz Yisrael, to Shleimah HaMelech. So we learned in Pasuk Yud Gimel, the HaMelech Shleimah in Nasa, where Malka Shavar is called Chetza Asher Sha'olam, or Vada Shemel from Malki Yad HaMelech Shleimah. That the king somehow gave something extra to Malka Shavar. What was this something extra? So there is a pirish which is printed parenthetically in Rashi. It's brought down by some of the other Mephoshim. That Shlomo actually married Malka Shiva. Well, now, and they had a child. According to others, he even had two children. And that is, as Koch he gave her what she had desired. And what happened afterwards is that he the Taylor for her, so he the other down. And the tragedy of this I mentioned last time is that having married Shlaima Hamela, and went back home. She went with her own entourage, and they did not remain as Jews, at least not as Jews, in Eretz Israel. Tonight, we'll discuss what happened. What was the follow-up? And much of this has to do with legends, more than with items that have a clear macar in the Paiskin. But nevertheless, being that this touches on a halachic issue, this is our discussion for this evening. The goodbye, the last mention of Malka Shiva, what happened afterwards? As you know, Malka Shiva came from Africa came from Kush. Presumably, Malka Shiva, as all Africans, was black-skinned. Halachically, that makes no difference. A Jew is a Jew. And the Rambam tells us that all of the foreign women who Shnoyna HaMelech married, he says, Khalima, if you want to think for a moment that Bar Leia began Yusan, that they were going, and that Shnoyna HaMelech married non-Jews, God forbid, Certainly they were Megayer. And that would extend also to Malka Shiva, which would mean if she was Megayer, that she was Jewish, and that she returned subsequently to Eretz Kush, somewhere, some land in Africa. And this would give us a source for having her descendants, Jews in Kush, Jews in Africa. We find in Navi, in many of the Nevois that are mentioned, that refer to the ultimate redemption of the Jews, that they refer to a redemption from Eretz Kush. For example, in Yishayah, in Yishayah, Yishayah Navi which says in Perakir Aleph, V'hoi Rabbi Yaimahu, Yosef Hashem, Shemus Yadai, Liknai Seshe'er Amai. Hashem will bring Jews back for the second time following the Chorban. The Jews that will remain, may Ashura, the Mitzrayim, the Pasrois, who may Kush. That Kaddish Baruch Hu, in the time of Mashiach, will bring back Jews from Africa. For us, that Nitzchei Yisrael, the Futsi Yehuda Yekabets, may Arba Kamfes Aretz. And we find this also in the Nevoah of Yemia, a reference to Jews returning from the land of Kush from Africa. Now, which Jews does this refer to? One can argue this refers to Jews who have moved to Africa, be it to Jews who moved to South Africa, or Egyptian Jews, or Jews in other lands. Jews are dispersed throughout the world. However, one issue that has enthralled and has mystified Jews throughout the centuries has been the status, the halachic status, or the origins of the African Jews in Ethiopia, who are black-skinned Jews, and who have been in Ethiopia for centuries, for many, many centuries, the Chalashitais. And before we even begin discussing the, discussing the Ethiopian Jews, the so-called Falashians, it's important to note that there are tribes in many countries that claim to have Jewish ancestry. There are people in India, there are people in other countries. There are even black Hebrews in America. But these are all Johnny-come-latelys. These are all people who have recently decided 
that they come from Jews. Their ancestors never dreamt that they come from Jews. So it's kind of clear that people who started coming from Jews many centuries later where their parents didn't come from Jews. So the mathematics of how they can come from Jewish ancestry when the parents don't is beyond most people. It's not the same with the Jews from Ethiopia. We know certainly for well over a thousand years we have recorded that there were people in Ethiopia who who claimed to come from Jews. And the question is whether there is any basis to assume that they're Jews. And furthermore, whether, where it comes, from where does it come that descendants of Yaakov Avinu will be black-skinned? The natural progression is that people who are white-skinned have children who have a white skin. And where would it come that Ethiopian Jews, if they are indeed from Yaakov Avinu, that their skin would have changed, their color would have changed? I guess, theoretically, it's possible for mutations to take place and for a white-skinned person, theoretically, to have a black-skinned child. But it's not something that we see happening. So how did this come about? Well, the first question regarding the status of the Ethiopian Jews, on the one hand, the halakhists that they follow are not identical to ours in all ways. There are many, many basic differences between that which they have and that which we have as a Torah. But on the other hand, there are some very basic tenets of Yiddishkeit that are unique to Judaism that they do hold of. And these include in Amuna, in Abayayayon, in Torah's Moshe, the Torah that was given at Hasinai, and in yearning for Tzion and Yerushalayim, which has been always unique among true Yidin, a yearning to return to Tzion, to return to Yerushalayim, has been something unique to from Eden throughout the centuries. It's what, even among Jews, the Friday Eden, Reform and Conservative Judaism in the late 19th century, when they still doubled Shemayn Esrei, took out all reference to Tzion and Yerushalayim from Shemayn Esrei. That was one of their innovations, that people should not be praying to return to Israel, that people should be praying for France or Germany, wherever they are. And they took out Tzion, Yerushalayim, the yearning to return to Yerushalayim was removed from the Shemayn Esrei when they still had a have a meaning that their people were going to die the Shemayn Esrei. They took out these references to Yerushalayim and to Tzion, which is why from an historical vintage point, it's kind of unusual that now they should want a foothold in Eretz Yisrael itself, where they're the ones who removed the yearning from Eretz Yisrael from Jewish hearts wherever they could. But the Ethiopian Jews always had a mention of Yerushalayim, of Sinai, of Mashiach. They had no Shas, no Talmud, and we'll see in a moment that they predate the Shas. And they had slightly different Hilkah Shabbos, although the Shabbos is on the seventh day of the week. One interesting halacha that the Falashian Jews have is that they hold that someone who fights or curses on Shabbos is Chayyad Misa. That that's a halacha on Shabbos, which is a Nice mashava, I don't need to put it into practice, but it's a nice mashava. It reminds me of the Shlo, the Shlo writes that someone who gets angry on Shabbos is over on the love of Leisavaru Eish Bechom Eish Vesech and Beyem HaShabbos. Somebody who gets angry on Shabbos. However, not all the halachas are the same, and this needs a bit of an investigation as to whether they are indeed Yidin. So first, let me tell you the connection to Malka Shiva. The Ethiopians, not the Ethiopian Jews, but Ethiopians in general, have what they refer to as a, their national history, their national epic, a book entitled Kebla Nagast, which means the glory of the kings. It's the history of the Ethiopian people. And they themselves, now this book exists for at least a thousand years. It's traced back historically to somewhere between the 6th and 9th century. And they trace back the lineage of their kings to the son of Shlomoi and Malkashava. This which we learned here today, that Malkashava returned to Africa. She went back pregnant with a child, that this child who was born to her 
whom the Ethiopians refer to as Menelik, that he was the first of the lineage of the kings of Ethiopia. They say that he went back to visit Shlomo HaMelech, to visit his father according to this tradition, and came back with knowledge of the halachis which he passed on. And again, according to Ethiopian legend, in the 4th century where most of Ethiopia, in the 5th century where most of Ethiopia converted to Christianity, the ancestors of today's Ethiopian Jews held fast to that which they had, the Messiah, from, again, according to this legend, from Malka Shava, that they come from Shlomo Amalek, that they're Jewish, and that this is their lineage. So, again, I'm not quoting the source in Chazal. We'll get to the sources there in a moment. But in Ethiopian legend, the source of Ethiopian Jewry, of the Falashians, is that they come from this uh, pasuk, from this by Nasan, by Hamela Shlaime Nasan Lamaka Shabbat is called Chetza, Lama is called Chetza, that she became pregnant with his child, and that this is the beginning of the lineage of the Ethiopian Jews. Now, Ethiopian Jews today do not claim lineage. They themselves say that this is what the Goyim say about them. But they themselves do not claim lineage from al They have a different shita, which I'll get to in a moment. But it's interesting, if one studies the secular sources, the, the secular sources write that in previous centuries, the Ethiopian Jews themselves claimed to come from Shlema and al so that we have the writings of an 18th century Scottish explorer by the name of James Bruce, who visited Ethiopia, visited Africa, and he writes that the Ethiopian Jews themselves came to come from Shlaima Yomach HaShiva. There is a book, the Beta Yisrael, written by, a contemporary book written by an individual named Steve Kaplan, who did some research, and he writes that in previous centuries, Ethiopian Jews themselves trace their lineage back to Shlomo Yomar Kashava. There's at least one other source from this, from some of the Christian missionaries in the 1800s, who also write of their attempt to convert the Jews of Ethiopia, and they too write that the Jews in Ethiopia themselves trace their lineage back to Yomar Kashava. Now, this is the first possibility of the source of Ethiopian Jewry. I don't know if it's true. I can't sit here today and tell you that I have any idea where Ethiopian Jewry comes from. But this explanation would explain why Ethiopian Jews have black skin. Why it is that they are black skin, that, is, that would make sense. Because they come from Akashava, they come from someone who is an African Jew, an African Gaius. If you look in the writings of the Ahwanian, they do not deal with Ethiopian Jews as descendants of Maka Shavah Vishlema Hamela. The only source that I'm aware of for the existence of Ethiopian Jews in Jewish source is in the writings of Elgar Hadoni. Now, Elgar Hadoni was a strange individual. Nobody knows for sure if he was a phony or if he was a true Talmud Chacham. He is someone who appeared in Bavel somewhere in the 8th or 9th century. And Elgar Adani claimed to come from Shevet Dani. And Elgar Adani wrote regarding his own ancestry, he says, Yeshnu Kabbalanu Kabbalah Ishbet Ve'ish, Shanachnu Bnei Don. We are the Kabbalah that we come from Shevet Dani. Where did they come from? So it's interesting that even according to him, they date back to approximately the time of Shlomo HaMelech. If we say the descendants of Shlomo HaMelech, they would date back to Melech HaMelech Perak Yud. The Elder Adori writes that his Kabbalah is, Kishomar Alei Am Yeruvam Ben Levat, Shehechti Es Yisrael. When Yeruvam Ben Levat stood up and broke off the ten Shvatim from the other two, for us, the Shnei Adlazar, the Nechlaka of Malchus Beis David, when the Malchus Beis David broke off, and that's going to happen in two Parakim, the Nechbitzu Ashvatim, the Amu Kumu, the Ilachmu, and the Chavam, the Yerushalayim, which we will learn soon, Nos Luetzel, Elech, and Mitzrayim. 
So at that time, Shoda Diamond wanted no part in the fragmentation of the Jews in Eretz Yisrael. So they went down back to Mitzrayim, the way our Derech Shalos Rabbi Seinu, they went over the law to go back to Mitzrayim in the same Derech that the original Yidin had gone up. Ela b'chter meilech leva lino tishay meiretz kush, the yadu meiretz kush, and with some of us are it's taiva ishmeina, and they settled in, in, in Ethiopia. So El Ben Adoni writes that he himself and his people are descendants of Shaydat Don, and he was an individual, obviously, with a lot of charisma, a big Talmud Chacham, and he went over many, many people to his story that there are black Jews in Ethiopia and that they trace themselves back to Shaydat Don. Now, how he explained why he was black-skinned and they were not is not mentioned, but it's not such a kasha. Because until recent times, it was believed that the climate of Africa and the heat in Africa bred in people to have black skin. It's only lately when we have a better understanding of genetics that we know it's not so, or at least we believe today it's not so. So it's Akasha. If they come from Shaded Dun, why are they black skin? Unless Shaded Dun will happen to be black skin. So it's Akasha. So I'm not sure. It's interesting. The Gemara of the Chayyim that men hey talks about the halachic status of a Kayan who has black skin, of a black skin Kayan. So I start to get all assumed it's possible. A Kayan can't be from Shaydat Dan, a Kayan is from Kayan. So if I start to get all the that it is somehow possible for it to happen that a person, now it could happen that Ben Allen could marry a woman who's a Giyayi who's a black skin, they can have a black skin child. So it could happen. But at any rate, Elbert Adani is the earliest source for the claim that Ethiopian Jews hold today, that they come from Shaida Dun. And again, it's interesting that it, it stems with the legend that they come from Akashava, at least time-wise, that this is certainly the time that they settled in Africa. The Ibn Ezra in Shema'is Karabbeis, Tasik Chavbeis, writes, Arulu, and it's Arulu, we should know today as well, that people tend to pass the halachas from storybooks. People read storybooks about great Gedalim or not such great Gedalim and others, and they tend to pass it on People tell me it says so the Fetish in the Wolf of the Bloss or one of the other books. So like Stephen Ezra, Klaal Oymelach, I'll tell you a rule. Kol Seifesh Le Kaspu Reviyu Mechachamim Bepiya Kadola, Enus Mechalov. You don't pass it on you can read the books, you can read these titles from stories. But if the author was not a authentic Novi Yachacham, so in this way, you don't pass the halachas from there. And certainly so, if the books say strange things that are contrary to what is normally logical. And he gives an example of the kacha, Sefer Zerubado, the Gan Sefer El Ben Adani, He mentions an example of the writings of El Ben Adani, which means that even Ezra held that the writings of El Ben Adani were suspect. On the other hand, we shine him, almost all we shine him, in the beginning of the Sefta Schulen, Taiswis, the Rosh, and the later we shine him, quote the Sefer in Hagei Eretz Yisrael, which is Aldar Adani's Munich Sefer, in a discussion of whether, now this is not a halacha that comes up often, the shine is whether a woman could be a sheikhit. Nobody ever asked me this one, Allah Halamaisa. But the shine is whether a woman is kosher to be a sheikhit. And I'm hearing even in the feminist movement today that they're pushing for this one. But at any rate, there's this question. Pashtus, women are kosher to be shaykh, and just like men, and the fayyid and the yisrashti and the mitzvashti and this and the veil, just like men. So Taisus and Elash quote this sefer. And although they disagree, la halacha, nevertheless, they quote the sefer as an authentic sefer. So we see that there's a certain amount of disagreement as to whether Elder Adani was a charlatan or someone to be taken seriously. So we have two possibilities. Ethiopian Jews could have come from the Queen of Sheba, from Akka Shavon, Shlaima Melech. They could have come from Shodat Don. References to Jews in Ethiopia are found sporadically throughout the centuries. The Bartanura, Rabbi Nadagi in the Bartanura, his parish on Mishnayus, we all read, traveled from Italy extensively to Eretz Israel, to Egypt. And we have today his letters that he wrote back to his relatives in Italy. And these letters have recently been translated. And in these, in these letters he writes of a visit 
to to Cairo. He writes that in Cairo he gave a sermon concerning the Sambatyan River, the legendary Sambatyan beyond which the Ten Shvatim are supposedly hidden. I have heard exactly what you have heard, however, it's no more than hearsay. He seems to question exactly the status of the Ten Shvatim. He says, but I do know one thing. One of the borders of Ethiopia is a mountainous countryside with great mountain ranges. There is no doubt that Jews live there. He seems to say, he says, there are no doubt in Suffolk that Jews live in Ethiopia. He writes a bit about the history of the Jews as it was told over to him. And then there's a crucial, a crucial passage. He says, I myself saw 12 of these Ethiopian Jews in Cairo. They were somewhat dark, but not as dark as Gentile Ethiopians. I cannot determine whether they were Karoyim or rabbinic Jews. In some matters, they appear to be Karoyim. For instance, they do not have any fire on in their houses on Shabbos. But in other matters, they follow rabbinic laws. People claim that these Ethiopian Jews claim to be descended from the tribe of Don. He goes on, he says, people say that the peppers and spices are grown by them. He says he met them, only two spoke Hebrew, the rest spoke Arabic, and a very shvach Arabic at that. So he relates us to meeting them, this is in the 1400s, and to say that without a doubt there are Jews in Ethiopia, he considers them Jews, as to whether they come from Don is lost news that people claim that they come from Don, which means that it's not for certain. Later, the Radvaz has a few truths on this topic, and he also asserts with Pashtus that Ethiopian Jews are Jews. This matter is again brought to us in the 16th century. There's a letter from a Rabbi Avram Alevi, who for the first time that I'm aware of uses a Russian Falashin or Falasa, because in the Batamura and the Radvaz, they might be referring to different Ethiopians or different African Jews. But here we find the Russian of Falashans. So we have an extensive historical background to say that there were Jews in Ethiopia. The Lamaisa of it in contemporary times is that this was a dormant issue as far as Allah Lamaisa was concerned until the late 19th century. At that time, Ethiopian Jews again traveled from Ethiopia up to Yerushalayim and they were met and they were interviewed and they were given in Israel who tried very much to help them. There was a Rav Nassim Adler, not the Rebbe of the Chesav Seifer, there was a Rav Nassim Adler who was a Rav in England who tried very much to help out the Ethiopian Jews and he wrote a letter to a Rav in Cairo, Rav Moshe Chazan, who was at that time the chief rabbi of Cairo, and he wanted to use him as a conduit for helping the Ethiopian Jews. And Rav Chazan wrote back, again, no, not questioning that they were Jews. He wrote that they're Jews, but they're Karoi. They don't keep halachis, but they know the Jews are Karoi, like Naimim and Naimim Eden. We don't antagonize them, but we don't help them. And therefore, he refused to be part of it. Rabbi Zmir was a he was he was a person with tremendous energy and Ishmaisa. And he put together actually an organization to try to help the Jews in Ethiopia and to bring them back to Yiddishkeit. He writes with a very strong Russian, he writes, Bikirbi Bayeras Esh Hatshuka, Lahitibahami. He says, I have a burning desire to do good to all Jews, Libi Aimami, Ki Olay Lama is Hamasa Hakodesh Azeh al Shikhmi. He says that in my heart, I feel that I have to take on my shoulders to help the Jews in Ethiopia. And he writes, Agav, and after a long peace, he says, Because I'm a gay, I'm not a little bit bitter. Ki achenu, a basarenu name, the chibor ha'es, la tzilom, a lachi aisam. He says, without doubt, they're Jews, and it is actually this time to get up and to help them. And he organized the Gedev and Israel of the late 19th century of Western Europe, to try to come together with Shasha Fal Hirsch, the Black of Eflinger, the Mechaber of Darfaner, to try to form some type of organization to help the Ethiopian Jews. Barry Rothschild actually funded a tremendous effort to help them to bring back Jews from Ethiopia, to teach them and send them there again. But this all has to do with the history of Ethiopian Jews. Our topic for tonight is the origin, where they come from. And while 
these Gedalim seem to assume that they are Yidin, we would have to say that there are two possibilities. One possibility that they come taka from Shedat Don, as we have from Elgar Adoni, and one possibility that they come from Akashvah Bishlema Hanela. Of course, we can't ignore that there is, after all the said and done, a third possibility. And the third possibility is that the Falashian Jews are in fact not Jews at all. It's certainly a possibility. And there are Gedalim today who argue, Rosh Sternbrook and his Truvis Van Hagis argues, that they're not Jews. As I read to you from the writings of the Batanula, he says, and again this is a translation, but they were somewhat dark, but not as dark as Gentile Ethiopians. Today's Falashians, Ethiopian Jews that we're familiar with, have the same skin color as other Ethiopians. Now again, the skin color is not something which makes anybody else you, but it's an indication that it's not the same people that the Batanula is referring to. Furthermore, the, the mini Hakaloyim, which the Radvaz and others refer to, is not really the meaning of the Ethiopian Jews that we have today. No, that again could have changed over time. But these are some of the arguments. The strongest argument against giving a Vada'i, saying with certainty that Ethiopian Jews come from Shevet Don, is based on a sugya in the Sefer Sanhedrin Dav The Gemara there talks about the Asera Sashvatim. We all know that the ten Shvatim outside of Yehuda and Binyamin went to Golis much before uh, the Chodim Beis Amigdash. What happened to them? Yirmiya and Ziran, Yirmiya brought it back some of them. But the majority of the Asera Sashvatim never returned. Where are they? So the Gemara Zira Dashin to Pasik, Vayishlachem Ma'eretz Acheres Kayem Azeh. The Pasik says that the ten Shvatim were thrown to a distant land, Kayem Azeh, as today. What does that mean, Kayem Azeh? So there are two opinions. Now, everybody tells over the more the wonderful sounding opinion, the one about the Sambachian River and it throws rocks on leagues and out of Shabbos, which of course sounds much more interesting, there's a nicer story to tell over, but it's a machlaikis. It's a machlaikis in the Gemara. It's a machlaikis for the Kiva and Rebbe Leezer. What does it mean, Kayay Mazer? Rebbe Leezer says, Mahayay Mahapiru Meir. Just like day, it's light and dark. Also, there's Sarah Sashvatim, for whom it's dark, it will come light again. I'll see the Lazar. They will eventually return. It's possible for the Sarah Sashvatim that they exist somewhere as Jews and they'll come back. But the Kiddush says no. That Nidmu ben Agayim, that the ten Shvatim that went out to Golis, they're lost, they're lost forever. Lost among the nations of the world. Ad kidei kach, there's a gmadiyama and yavamis to Zayim and Beis, that holds that if any guy, any non-Jew, gives Kedushin to a Jew, of course that's nothing, a guy doesn't have Kedushin with a Yid. So the Gemara wants to say, that if a non-Jew gives Kedushin to a year, it's Sofi Kedushin, Shema Me'aseres HaShvatim Heim. There might be a descendant of the ten Shvatim that are mixed out among the Gaia. So the Gemara asks, yes, we go by Sarai, the Gemara says, in the case of Kavua. But that's not the point. The Gemara holds at that, that at least according to Rabbi Kiva, that the ten Shvatim are gone. It's said, but it's not the first time. We know before the Jews left Mitzrayim, Chamushim Olu B'nei Yisrael Me'aretz Mitzrayim, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yerliya tells us in the Vua, cleans out Yidin as you take gold or silver out of ore. And just like part of the ore falls away when you take out the gold and silver, so too among Chal Yisrael, when they went out of Mitzrayim, we know many Jews did not leave Mitzrayim. And the same thing happened with the Asar HaShvatim. They were lost. It's safe to say, but it's happening today as well. A great percentage of Yidin are being lost to Yiddishkeit. They're growing up and don't know whether they are Yidin or not. Say as it might be, but this, according to the Gemara, is one of two opinions. What happened to the ten tribes? To the Aseris or Shvatim? So either they're behind the Sambatya, they're somewhere, or they're lost. So Agis or Shtambuch, 
Today we know the world is open. It's not as it was centuries ago where you didn't know what lay behind the next river. We know the world is charted. We know that there is no place where the Jews live, the Aseris Ashvatim, where there are millions of Jews hidden behind a magical river. So our Karkach, the Halach is like Rabbi Kiva, Nidmu Bein Agayim. So he argues that perhaps these Ethiopian Jews are not Jews at all, but from the time that the original, those who converted to Christianity, we know the early Christians held much of what they refer to as the Old Testament of the Dine Atayra, they held Shabbos on the seventh day. And he says we have to be chayshish, that these Ethiopian Jews are not Jews at all. However, this whole argument, based on Aseris Ashvatim, is only an argument if you hold that they came from Shevet Dan. If we follow the possibility that they come from Shloima Yomakashava, that if the European Jews trace their lineage back to Makashava and Shloima, if that is the case, then there's no Kasha from the Aseris Ashvatim. The Aseris Ashvatim needs more than a guy. The descendants of David and Shloima HaMelech had a had a schus, of course, a schus of parents as David and Shlaimai, to remain Jews, and the whole kasha would fall away. As a matter of halacha, it's a very difficult issue, the issue of Ethiopian Jews marrying into Jews. The question has to do with the laws of Mamzerus, the fact that if the Ethiopian Jews indeed are Jews, their help is given, leave much to be desired. And also there's a sugi nyevamis that Yudzayim, which discusses whether one is permitted to marry into the Aseris Ashvatim. So the status is something which is quite an issue of debate. As a matter of halacha, I believe most Paiskin follow the Psak, the earliest source for this Psak I know is Rav Herzog Paskin in a Tshuva written in 1954, that we can be Matia, Ethiopian Jews, to marry into Klai Yisrael, based on a spex faker, based on a double suffix. He held that we require gamers. It's a suffix. Are they given or not? So let them be Megayim. It's not a difficult thing. It could be yikes of the suffix. They might not be Jews. Let them be Megayim. So he argues that this possibility that their guardian is a big favor to, to Ethiopian Jews because this creates a spex faker. We have two spakers. Number one, are they Jewish or not? Now, if they're not Jews, ain't Mamzerus, the Bidayako. By Goyim, there is no Mamzerus. If Goyim, even if the Mizan of the Venetian Ish among the Nayak, there is no status of Mamzerus to Goyim. So if they're Goyim, there are no Mamzerus between them. That's one suffix. And even if they're Yidden, once they're Yidden, there's also a suffix. We don't know for sure any given Ethiopian Jew if he has a suffix Mamzerus in his lineage or not. No more than a suffix, because the whole argument regarding the status of Ethiopian Jews is based on the fact that their hochis gitten don't satisfy halacha. So that if someone, if a, if a married Ethiopian Jew got a get and remarried, she would be an Asia Sish, her children would be Mamzerim, that's only a suffix. So being that there's a past, it's a suffix Mamzerim anyway, plus we have the suffix if. The Yidn or Gayim, it's a Svex Vaker, a Svex Vaker is Mutter. So for that reason, the Psak of Avrotzag was, if Maisha followed in the same Svara, let them be Megaya, and if the Gayus, it's a Svex Vaker, and it's Mutter Muskate Nimayim, and it's Mutter to marry into the Ethiopian Jews. So this is basically the three possibilities as to the origins. Marka Shava, Don, or the question whether they're Jews at all. And this is the Psak Halach. Now it's interesting that such a discussion, which is based on stories and legends, in the final bottom line, comes down to one of the basic Yisraelis that we talk about Yeshidas. Because after all is said and done, if we're going to be Matu them with Tom Svek Sveka, people still would have the question, oh. What is a spec fake? Spec fake means that it's most likely that you're permitted to marry them. Right? It's a suffix of the Yidna Gaia. Even if they Yidna, it's a suffix of the Mamzeris. To spec is somewhat. So a person would still ask, is there a reason why Hachmir is mutter? 
But most people would be afraid. You're talking about yichus. So to be married someone based on spec snake, the question would still be, is there a mock for your Shemaya Mahachmir to be afraid to be Sonic on a spec snake? There is a possibility, in fact, that there, there is a shadow of Mamzerus. There's a possibility that you're not allowed to marry them. Is there at all a mock in Mahachmir? So this comes to one of the most basic hakiras in the writings of the Gedolei Rosh Hashivas who wrote regarding Svek Sveka. And this is Negea to many halachists besides the issue of marrying Ethiopian Jews, but the issues of other issues of Svek Sveka and halacha. And this we claim in Yeshiva, most issues of Svek Sveka come down to a question as to whether a spec speaker is what we call in yeshiva mutter mitam vadai or mutter mitam suffik. And let me explain that. Let me give you an example of spec speaker that takes place in your homes. Okay, spec speaker is everywhere. You don't see it. But behind the scenes, and there are many things you do, there lurks a spec speaker in the background of halacha. And I'll give you one example. Let's say you buy chicken. And you take it home and you find that the wing of the chicken, the bone is broken. The bone of the chicken is broken. It's a Shaila Trafus. So you have to take the chicken to the rock to find out if it's kosher or not. Why is the halacha regarding a broken wing? A broken wing is not in itself Trafus. A broken wing bone, an animal could, bird could live with a broken wing bone for a long time. However, a broken wing bone on a chicken which flaps its wings all the time the broken bone tends to pierce the chest and the lungs of the chicken. So we saw a live chicken with a broken wing bone, so we would not use that chicken until we checked, unless we did a proper bedik on the lungs. Why did you find a chicken, not a live chicken? If we found live chickens, we wouldn't have any idea what to do with it. Probably wouldn't even recognize that it's a chicken. But we get chickens that are, coming there that are created in plastic, and we unwrap the cellophane and we find a broken chicken bone. So somewhere on the assembly line, when they put it together, they made a mistake. What's the deal? So it says, Yishot HaMarech, it's more to become spec speaker. One topic, maybe the chicken bone, the wing broke after Shrita. If it broke after Shrita, then it can't be not a child of Trafus, because once a chicken is dead, it can't become a Trafus. Or maybe even if it broke before Shrita, maybe it didn't make a hole in the lungs. So it's more to, it says in Ramah, it's more to become spec speaker. Now what happens if you are a farmer and you shechted the chicken and you still have the lungs and you find a broken bone, it's mutter betam spek sveka, one minute. You have the ability now to check the lung and see if it has a hole. It's actually the vuray. You can check to see if there is a hole in the lung or not. So what are you going to say? It's mutter betam spek sveka. Maybe the blood broke after shkita. In which case, there's no shayla. And maybe before Shrita and the longest hole, well, I make long distance. Take out the long and check it. So the Ramon writes in Simon Kuf Yod Sif Tes that one is not obligated to check. That if you have a Svek Sveka, don't, you can take the long and throw it away. You don't have to check if there's a hole in it. A Svek Sveka is mutter. The Shah brings the Shita Sarajba who disagrees. And he says a Svek Sveka one does have to check a spec speaker. What does the Shaila depend on? Pashtus. The Ramah holds a spec speaker is mutter mi tam vadai, which means a spec speaker is certainly mutter. The Torah is given that a spec speaker is vadai mutter. You don't have to check. And the Rajma Pashtus holds mutter mi tam suffic. If you could check, you check. Now this lundus comes down to a very basic question, which Reb Shimon in his Shari Yosha talks about at length in numerous occasions. And this has to do with the status of even a single suffix. And let me give you just an illustration of what Reb Shimon is talking about. We know suffix that rise on the Chumrah. If you have one suffix, it's awesome. If you have two spakes, it's mutter. So let me illustrate to you what we're discussing here. You come home one day and you have a nice piece of steak on the plate in front of you, you're hungry. And your wife tells you, you know, this piece of steak is a Suffolk Teresa. How is a Suffolk Teresa? You can dream it up yourself. 
Okay? She bought it, and it's a suffix. It came from the Kushan or the or whatever. This is a suffix to rice. It had on the label a hexha, and it said Kushan suffix to rice. So you have a piece of suffix to rice. So what's it mean? So you know, suffix to rice. It's a good piece of meat. But let's say it's a kosher piece of meat. got mixed out with a trafer piece, and one of them got lost. You're left with one. That's the halacha. Suffix to rice. So halacha is, you ask the rav, you call up the rav, you tell him, look, I have this funny looking piece of meat. It's a suffix to rice and a chumah piece of meat. What do I do? The Rav says, something that rice will come throw it out. No question. Now, what happens if you're hungry? And you feel in a lucky mood. You feel like, you know, it's a pretty, been a pretty lucky day for me today. You know, maybe things went well at work, or you won the lottery. Things are going well. So you tell yourself, you know something? I'm kind of hungry. It's a 50-50 chance. Right? Might be crushing me, it might be tray for me. But the rabbi says, 50-50, you got to throw it out. But who knows? Look, it might be kosher. Now, let's say we should do this. But let's say, somebody says, look, I'll take my chances. And he goes, and he figures, I don't know what he does with a bracha, it's a suffer bracha, so he does that, he makes a bracha on something else to be might see this. And he goes and he eats the steak, and he figures, Lachamele, the Esrim will come up to Shemayim, and I'll ask them the first thing, was it kosher meat or was it tray for me? So, the past is 120 years, he comes up to Shemayim, and he can't wait. He goes over right away, he comes up to Shemayim, before he goes into the Bezish of Mawa, he runs over to the Malach, he says, look, you got connections. I've been curious for the last hundred years, this steak I ate that day, what was it? Was it kosher or was it treif? Look, so the Malach rolls back the videotape, and he plays back where the meat came from. He tells him, you know something? Your lucky day. That piece of meat, Taka got mixed out with a piece of treif of meat, but it was the treif of meat that got uh, thrown out, and your meat was the kosher meat. Ah, oh, wonderful. He says, Baruch Hashem. And he goes into the bed and Shomayla is all ready for his dinner. You know, wonderful. It's a good bed. So Rav Shimon says, he said, coming to the bed and Shomayla. They understand Rav Shimon doesn't give this exact illustration. But he says, following in Shar Aleph, Perichas. He said, coming to the bed and Shomayla. And he's going to sit there and they're putting his mitzvahs on one side and whatever they put on the other side, right? And he's watching it wave. It's going well. And he sees the malach comes in with the... He recognizes that piece of steak, right? He's coming in with the piece of steak. What's he doing with the piece of steak? He's putting it on the other side. So he starts screaming. He says, what do you mean? That was kosher meat. He says, what do you Sotik the rice of the chumrah is also mitam badai. This fellow, he was over in Avela. Because the din of steak is, something that rice in the chumrah is a din that is vada'i asr. If the halach is, you can't eat it, because something that rice in the chumrah, so that piece of meat, you're not allowed to eat, period. Even if klapish maya galia, it was kosher meat, but you were over it. There's an isr of something that rice in the chumrah. You were over that isr. So he says that that piece of meat, it goes on the other side of the scale, it's not going to help you in anything. You're in a better mood, it's not going to help, it's Vada Yisr. Of course the Yisr is because it was a Sotik. But it's certainly Yisr, it's Vada Yisr. When the Torah says Sotik that rise in the Chumrah, it's certainly also to eat it. Rabbi Chama and the Chayvet Sa'ar, assuming them Dalit, brings from the Tzemach Tzedek, the same Yisrael, that Sotik Yisr is Vada Yisr. It brings a right. He says, how do you bring a Kodan Asham? If you eat Sotik Chayla, if you bring a Kodan Asham, <laughs> How can you bring a carbon ashram? Maybe what you ate was kosher. And the carbon you're bringing in the base of Mingdash, it's Chulun Bazara. You don't need a kapara. It must be that you're a vada over on something. When you eat a Sophic Yisr, you're certainly over on an Yisr. Sophic Daraisa of the Chumr is vada Yisr. It's not Sophic Yisr. That's all when it's one Sophic. Zafrib Shimin, further in Shad Aleph and Tarek Zion. By the same token, just like one Sotik, is Vadai Yasser. A speck speaker is Vadai Mutter. If you have a piece of meat, you come home, and you get a piece of meat, and this one says on it, caution, speck speaker. It's a speck speaker piece of meat. And you're going to think to yourself, speck speaker, I better not eat it. I want to take a chance, maybe I'll come up to Shemayim, and they'll play back the video, and they'll show me that it was trade. So to Shimon, no. Svek Svekha is mutter mitam vadai. When you have a Svek Svekha, it's certainly mutter. Your vadai allowed to eat it. And even if klape shmaya galya, 
if it's known in Shemayim that this was tray, but you're allowed to eat it. The halacha is a tray for a piece of meat which evolves into a svex veika. Now you're not allowed to create a svex veika deliberately, but if it evolved into a svex veika, vaday mutter. You're 100% allowed to eat it. And this explains the shita salama. The even when it's eshul of ruei, there's no chiyuv to be mevar. Now the Rajba appears to argue, the Shach B'Shem Rajba says you do have to be Baidik. Now the Yehuda Kama Simen Zayin says it's not so. He says that there is no Chiyah Baba, even according to the Rajba, and he tries to explain the Rajba. At any rate, according to many of the Gedele HaPaiskin, a Svek Sveka, there's no Chiyah Baba, the Shaila comes up with an Ashish Kayan, the wife of a Kayan who's pregnant. Is she allowed to go to a Levaya or to a cemetery? She might be carrying a kayan. The halacha is, the shach says it's mutter because it's a specs maker. One sotik, maybe she's carrying a girl. B'nei Aaron, the B'nei Aaron. Females are not mechuyin in Isetuma. And, so that's 50-50. It might be a zacha, it might be in the keva. Plus, the second sotik, that even if it's a zacha, it might not be a ben kayama. There's a certain percentage of children that don't survive birth for the first 30 days of childbirth. So specs maker is that it's mutter. Today we can do sonograms. It could be Mavarer if it's a Zohar in the cave. There's no here to be Mavar. Now if someone took the sonogram and knows it's a Zohar in Achinami, according to the Shach, a person would have to be Mahmer. But otherwise, in Aisha's Kayim of Baris, there's no more here to be Mavar. Smech Smech is, like I said, are everywhere. The Shilas of the old baseball glove Shiloh with the Shachnas in the baseball glove. Because Aisha was not here, the paddings of the baseball glove. Also because it's Smech Smech, that's Dura the Shachnas, it's not for now. But it has to do with Svek Sveka too. If you hold Svek Sveka is only Mutter and it comes Suffolk, so why take a chance with a baseball glove? Right, for some people it's a Sarah Kadu, for some people it's a Sarah Kadu. Or be Mavaya, have the padding check. But that particular padding, the way it's made, is a Svek Sveka. Because Anish says that there's no Chiyav, uh, strictly speaking, there are a lot of no Chiyav Mavaya. If we may mind that Svek Sveka is a Mutter, so it's Mutter. To marry into Ethiopian Jewry, to marry into people who's based their tail on specs, they are 100% mutter. Now you might be bothered. Maybe a Leo and Abiyo come. Mishiach will come and Tishbi and Tarot's Kushis So you're going to marry someone who's mutter metam specs maker. But maybe Chas Vishalim, a Leo and Abiyo come. They'll say, ah, your children and grandchildren, you lost. The one you married was a Mamzer. What do you do then? So the Mishnah says at the end of Ediyas, it says, Ein Eliyahu Ba, Loi Letayev, Loi Letame, Loi Letarev, Loi Lerachek. Eliyahu Anavi is not going to tell these secrets. If you are Mamzerim that are mixed out into Kla Yisrael, the Heter, Eliyahu is not going to be Megala. A Mamzer Shem Nidma is Nidma is Mutter. And even when Mashiach will come, these people will remain Mutter. The Mishnah ends, Eliyahu Ba, Eliyahu Lase Sholem Ba'olam. Eliyahu's purpose is to make Sholem, not to make Pirudim. So it would turn out that if we hold the heter of Svex Vega, it's an absolute heter. A person would be permitted to marry people who have the lineage of Svex Vega. Of course, we're following the psaac of the Gedele and uh, Yisrael that they should go through a gayless. But they're notwithstanding that there is a heter of Svex Vega. So it comes out that we have here in this topic a some of the greatest legends in our history in Klai Yisrael, the status of the ten tribes, that's Eres Ashvatim. And B, some of the most these basic longest in the halachas of Safik Teraisa. There's one more lesson regarding the Ethiopian Jews, which I think is unfortunately lost on many people. And that is the great fortune we have to be members of Klai Yisrael. You know, Pesach is a time that we say thank you to Hashem. We thank the Rabbi Nishalem for what? We thank the Kaddish Baruch Hu Shatziyanu Mimitzrayim, Mishnah Nosnam Manu Esat Taira, Veshavienu Baritz Yisrael. We thank Hashem for so much. But one of the basic things to thank our Kaddish Baruch Hu was for the creation of a, of a family of Klai Yisrael with all the fights that Jews have among themselves. That was still in Uma, a Mishpach of B'nai Yisrael. You know, we say at the Haggadah, Yidu Karavanu Lefnei HaSinai, Vulay Nosnam Manu Esat Taira Dayenu. Hashem will have brought us before our Sinai Dayenu, the Yichus of bringing us to our Sinai. So different people say different Turits and different Sedarim. But the Yichus is Karvenu of the Sinai, and the Kala Yisrael became Khatifa Achas, Ka'am Echad, Belayd Echad. Whenever I drive past the bus stop 
And uh, you see sometimes you even waiting by a bus stop. So you stop, you pick them up, you give them a lift. And what do you do? You pull up, there are Yidin and Goyim standing there, you open the door. It's a person you never met, you don't know. But Mazet is a Yid, he sees a Yid, you open the door, he sees your Yid, he comes in. Such a wonderful feeling besides the chesed involved in helping the Yid who's waiting for a bus. But the feeling of, of being a member of part of Klai Israel. It's people who travel to out of town, people who travel to places where they don't expect to see Yid and they see a Yid. So it's the Kulam Amechot, Mishpach Achas. The Falashans, Ethiopian Jews. So little was made of it. Much should have been made of it. How many nations in the world would be willing to go to take penniless people out of it. From Africa, the, country, the whole world is a tremendous racism against blacks. And Israel, which is without a question a white country, went and without a word, without any, anybody being against it, on the contrary, it was dancing in the streets, brought back Yidin from Ethiopia, what a kiddush Hashem, just because they Yidin. What a wonderful feeling. Let me tell you the Radvaz is Chuva. I told you the Radvaz says, that they came from Sheva Don. What is this Shiloh? Someone bought a slave on the open market, an Ethiopian Jew. So he asked the Radvaz, the Allah is in Ever Ivri goes out to Sheish, goes out after six years. So he asked the Radvaz, why was this Shiloh if he's Jewish or not? The master bought this slave, he has to have to let him go after six years. He's, he's in Ever Ivri. Answers the Radvaz, you have to remember, we're talking in a society in the 16th century where slavery was accepted by all, where bad blacks were enslaved all over the world. Zokta Radvaz, not only you have to let him out after six years, you have to let him go today. When you buy a Jew on the slave market, that's not called buying, that's called pidgin shmuyim. You buy him, you have to let him free, you have to let him go. The Bartanur in his letters writes that in the slave markets of Cairo, Jews would be paid the shulim, they buy the Ethiopian Jews. What a message of an actress of Am Yisrael, which people lose. Rabbi Chonu writes in the Kavitz Mamorim, that when we say, Ani Hashem, that Hashem took us out of Mitzrayim, Ani V'lai HaSholiach. What's the godless of Ani V'lai HaSholiach? It's not Rabbi Chonu. There's a concept of a tzibur, of an actus of a people. And until the night of Bacchus Bechaynus, Yidin were members of Mitzrayim. They were not an Ummah, a nation themselves. On that night of Pesach, HaKadosh Baruch Hu went, and he said that a gzairah against the tzibur of Mitzrayim does not apply to Jews of Mitzrayim. Hashem, Pesach, HaBatei B'nei Yisrael B'Mitzrayim, B'nok Fais Mitzrayim, as B'tei Yitzil. That's the great thing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu, he had done it for nine Makkas before. And he had left out the, the Yidin and the other nine Makkas. What was special about Makkas Bechayris? Because Makkas Bechayris, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, at that time went to Kvaydu Biatzmai. And he declared that Kva Yisrael is Uma Achas, Mishpacha Achas. If there's a lesson to be taken out, you go to Eretz Yisrael, and you see, now I don't say there's racism everywhere, but to the degree, certainly in former circles, that you go into the yeshivas there and you see Yidin with white skin, with black skin, they're both learning, they're sitting and learning the same time as Hashem, sitting and learning together. How this should reawaken in us, a, within us, a ahava for Klai Yisrael, a feeling of being fortunate to be in a part of Am Yisrael, and hopefully a longing to have an Abbas Yisrael and this type of a feeling. It's Hashem, we continue 71 hours from now. Uh, good night to everybody.